All right, so welcome to lesson five, reproductive system. We will look at the homeostatic components that are looking to control certain aspects of the reproductive organs and how they all kind of cooperate to ensure the proper functioning of those reproductive organs. So when we think about reproduction and we think about it in the context of, of human evolution and human biology as a whole, uh, you need to be mindful that puberty needs to happen before this can uh, occur. So puberty is triggered by a series of these hormonal changes that are going to kind of be that theme of, of this unit uh, in the context of homeostasis. But we're looking at the hormonal changes that result in the development of those secondary sexual characteristics uh, in terms of initiating the formation of those mature gametes. And it's all in an attempt to reproduce. So those um, those neuroendocrine controls, which we'll talk about in the neuro system, will be the ones that contribute to kind of triggering that sequence of hormonal changes. So the hypothalamus begins releasing gonadotropin, and it also begins releasing the hormone, or that yeah, gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GNRH, which controls the release of even more hormones uh, from the anterior pituitary gland. And it's all uh, going to control the synthesis and release of those hormones that are associated with the development of those secondary sex characteristics and the development of the sexual organs. So the brain is responsible for initiating that change in those organs that are responsible for reproduction. So the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are the key ones that we're going to spend a great deal of time talking about. Uh, FSH, oops. FSH and LH are going to be the big ones that we discuss, specifically in terms of how they um, relate. So we'll look at gonads, which are the sex glands. So when you think about glands as a whole, uh, it, remember to differentiate between exocrine and endocrine. The gonads are the sex glands that produce and secrete most of those hormones. Uh, in human beings and in most mammals, we're looking at ovaries and testes. So those gonads, gonads are going to produce steroid hormones and they are going to consist of the androgens, estrogens, and progestins that regulate the development of those reproductive systems, the characteristics, the secondary sexual characteristics you see in humans, as well as overall mating behavior and patterns. Uh, it's important to recognize that the uh, androgens and testosterone are the major ones when we think about it in terms of females and males. And it's important to also realize that both males and females produce all of these hormones, um, and, and it's, it's interesting to think about the way that they both work because if they do produce both of these or all three of these types of hormones, why don't they have a similar effect? And it, and it has to do with a lot of the quantity. It has to do with the frequency. It also in some capacity has to do with the receptors on cells uh, that different genders have or different sexes have. So it's interesting to consider males and females in the context of even at a cellular level, uh, they have di some different types of receptors that are responsible for uh, accepting some of these hormones. Uh, but the main components that relate to that are quantity and frequency. So we're gonna start with the female reproductive system first and look at an overview of the anatomy of it and the general idea uh, of how those systems work together. So the, we'll look at each reproductive organ in a bit of detail and then we'll look at how certain things uh, function in that system. So when you think of the ovaries, they are responsible for producing the ova or the mature egg. Uh, they are suspended in the abdominal cavity, just about the size of your thumb. And they produce the estrogen hormone, which is going to stimulate and control that development of those reproductive systems within females. So breast development, growth of body hair, the widening of pelvis, and a development of the overall sex drive. It's important to recognize that, again, those idea of those estrogen and progestins, they're the content and the amount and how they're taken up by a female is completely different than how it's done in males. So when you think about progestins or progesterone, uh, they are going to prepare and maintain the uterus for implantation of a fertilized egg, as well as the subsequent growth and development of the embryo. It thickens the lining. It also creates a mucous membrane as a result of high concentrations of progesterone. Uh, it thickens the lining. It also produces a mucus seal to seal the uterus once that fertilized egg has implanted. And it is one of the main hormones that uh, pregnancy tests actually test for. Uh, because most on average, uh, when a fertilized egg is implanted in the uterus, you start to see progesterone 
uh, hormone levels skyrocket as a result of, of that pregnancy. So the ovaries are, are quite important with regards to the overall reproductive system of a female. And it's important to recognize that uh, those hormone levels that they produce are, are really important to how they can like how contextually things change and develop as a result. The oviducts are tubes from each ovary that are lined with cilia and they help move the egg into the uterus. Uh, and again, if you're looking for the specific, um, if you are looking at the specific uh, of how they're connected, uh, the diagram is above there. Yeah, but the eggs are all females that are born genetically female. All of the eggs that they will have throughout the course of their life have already been produced. Uh, the ovaries are the ones that or sorry, have already been made. They produce the egg out of the ovary. So it, the ovaries are responsible for basically sending that mature egg out into the, uh, the wild, so to speak. Uh, but it turns that egg mature. The eggs are not all mature. Um, so all females that are born genetically female do not have mature ova, uh, or I'm sorry, mature eggs. The eggs have to be matured. And once they are matured, they are released once a month. So like I said, the oviducts are the ones that are responsible for transporting the egg to the uterus. And then we have, oops, we have the uterus itself, which is a hollow structure with walls that contain smooth muscle that are controlled by oxytocin. Uh, oxytocin. Uh, we have no voluntary control over the smooth muscles in our bodies and the uterus is made of that smooth muscle. It's also lined with something called an endometrium where those fertilized eggs implant. It's highly, highly, highly vascularized. So there's a ton of ton of blood flow within that region and that allows for that fertilized egg to receive the necessary nutrients once it is implanted in there. And then lastly, it has a component of the uterus that's called the cervix, which is located at the bottom of the uterus, uh, connected directly into the vagina. And as a result of that, like I said, that result of the increased progesterone hormone, it uh, creates that mucus seal that seals up the uterus uh, to keep that fertilized egg in there. Lastly, we have the vagina or the vaginal canal. It is the muscular canal that leads to the exterior of that uterus. This is where sperm enter and it is connected directly into the female reproductive tract. And so the reproductive organs as a whole with regards to uh, biological females, it's important to realize that they all kind of have to work in together in conjuncture uh, for reproduction to occur. So it's interesting to think about it in the context of, of all mammals and animals because the vast majority of animals that have a similar reproductive system, uh, they behave in a similar way in terms of um, the specific organ structures. You might see secondary uh, sexual features not being quite the same, uh, but in, on average, when those animals hit sexual maturity, they tend to grow in size in some way, shape or form in different areas. And then as a result of that, their, their behaviors can change and that allows for them to essentially reproduce. You kind of look at it a little bit in grade 11 biology with regards to uh, some of the ways that different species are unable to interact and reproduce with each other. And it has a lot to do with the biological components that we talk about moving forward. So it's important to recognize that these systems work in, in combination to help with reproduction. And the major component of this is, is the production of that mature egg. And that process is called oogenesis. And it's the production of that uh, by the ovaries of the immature egg. So the ovaries produce immature eggs when you're born, right? Those oocytes and during that embryonic development, like we talked about earlier, all biological female women are born with the right, of, the, the amount of eggs that they will have for their duration of their life cycle. Once that sexual maturity is reached, however, those female oocytes within the ovaries start to grow and mature. And, and that's where that menstrual cycle comes from. So they grow and they mature each menstrual cycle. Once a month, you're looking at that release of a mature ovum or a mature, um, a mature egg. So usually one will become mature and it will go through that first meiotic division and be released. Only if the egg is fertilized, only if the egg is fertilized does that oocyte go through its second meiotic division. So eggs are essentially um, frozen in that division in, until that ovarian cycle is triggered as a result of fertilization. So when you look at human ovarian and menstrual cycle hormones, again, we really are gonna start to talk about the specifics of how those hormone levels uh, help return things to, to homeostatic balance because the process itself 
is is quite information heavy. Uh, so I'm going to take a lot of time to discuss this the the human ovarian and menstrual cycle with regards to the hormones that are responsible for it. So recall that ovarian mature egg. When we talk about the menstrual cycle as a whole, we're talking about the formation and loss of the uterine lining. Okay, so from the top, when you look at those gonadotropin releasing hormones or GNRHs, you really have to think about the idea of, again, that hormone is an attempt to help with those cellular communications. So this hormone is released by the hypothalamus and it initiates the start of that ovarian cycle. So this stimulates the pituitary gland to then release that FSH as well as that LH into the bloodstream. So the target for these hormones are the ovaries. Do they get everywhere else? Yes, but the only cells, the only cells that have the proper receptors for these, this FSH and LH are the ovaries. Now, do other cells have some types of receptors for LH and FSH, yes. And it, that's why it can have an impact on other bodily functions as well. And I'll talk more a little bit about that, but its main target is the ovary. Its main target is the ovary. So FSH is responsible for stimulants. It will stimulate six to 20 oocytes to begin meiosis and growth within a follicle. So it's gonna stimulate the production of estrogen within that follicle structure. So estrogen is, as it increases, it signals the pituitary gland to stop releasing that FSH and it stimulates the release of even more LH. So here we have an example of a negative feedback on FSH, but a positive feedback on luteinizing hormone. So estrogen is also secreted by the corpus luteum after ovulation to cause thickening of the endometrium. So again, that endometrium is the uterine lining. When we talk about the follicle, we're talking about the follicle within the ovary. And that's, yeah, that's what we're talking about with regards to that. The last hormone that we'll look at with regards to the specifics of that uh, menstrual cycle is LH, that luteinizing hormone. A spike in luteinizing hormone signals the mature egg to be released or to ovulate. And it's usually around day 14 of that entire monthly cycle. The remaining follicle cells grow in an, into enlarged yellow structure called the corpus luteum, which is release, which releases estrogen, progesterone, and inhibin hormones. So the three big players, or the four big players, I should say, of the menstrual cycle are that GnRH, FSH, estrogen, and luteinizing hormone. There are other ancillary uh, hormones. I'll talk about progesterone in a second, but those are the big four, so to speak, when it comes to the control and the development of that mature egg. So progesterone is going to stimulate thickening of the uterine lining. It will inhibit uterine contraction and it will uh, inhibit the secretion of that GnRH and therefore the LH and FSH. So we're looking at, oops, we're looking at the, uh, the new follicle growth stopping as a result of that progesterone. So as you expect progesterone levels increase towards the end of that ovulation cycle, it will stop that GnRH and therefore that luteinizing and, uh, FSH and LH. And as a result of that, it will, you will see some negative in, in inhibition with regards to the production of those other hormones by progesterone. So what effect will this have? Well, this will have a thickened lining. A thickened lining will be attached to the uterus. And as a result of that, it will be leading to a preparation for pregnancy. Because again, the entire menstrual cycle as a whole is a biological feature with which it is preparing that, uh, that structure for the reproduction process, okay? So when we talk about what that means, the preparation for pregnancy, uh, it's important to recognize that the female menstrual cycle prepares the uterine uh, lining by thickening it, okay? That thickening of the uterine lining allows for the implantation of a fertilized egg. This tissue becomes incredibly highly vascularized to support that fetus, so around that time, when you, and again, this diagram I'll talk a little bit about after the fact, after I go through the details. But again, the key component here is that that tissue becomes highly vascularized and it's, a, it's all in an attempt to support that fertilized egg. And again, usually one, only one egg is released, ovulation, from the ovaries each cycle. What will happen with twins? Well, twins has to do with uh, two eggs maturing. So fraternal twins are when two eggs mature. And identical twins are when one egg matures, but that zygote cell then breaks in half to become a completely different individual that will then go through 
mitosis later on. So we don't really talk about fraternal versus identical twins too much in this in this class, but it's just important to recognize that uh, those are the difference between the two of them. The egg will then travel to the fallopian tube and into the uterus, or through the fallopian tube and into the uterus. And the fertilization may happen here within 24 hours uh, of, of ovulation. So anywhere from uh, even, I would say, 12 to 24 hours of ovulation, it's possible for that, um, for that fertilization to happen. So as we look through this diagram, I recognize it's not the clearest diagram in the world. Hopefully the diagram that you have is a little bit clearer. When we're looking at the concentrations of each of the different hormones through each of the different stages, recognize that that timeline here at the bottom is looking at the days of the cycle, right? So it's really important to recognize that they're all kind of happening in conjunction with each other and recognize that it's important that they are connected to each other. So when we look at the concentration of FSH and LH up at the top, right? We're looking at that huge amount of FSH and LH that will stimulate the oocyte development as well as that follicle growth, okay? So when that burst hits, we're looking at the release of a mature egg. So the FSH kind of steadily increases and goes down a bit. LH is steadily increasing and they're gonna stimulate that oocyte development. At that big spike right here, it's going to coincide with the release of a matured egg. So FSH and LH will kind of increase a little bit leading up to that release to help stimulate the uh, oocyte development. But again, it's that big spike that will allow for the release of the matured egg. So the mature egg compo uh, compartment or component oopsies, uh, of the ovarian there is looking at the release of the mature egg and then the formation of the corpus luteum, that yellow structure towards the end of the cycle. When we look at the concentrations of estrogen as well as that GnRH um, component, we really need to think about it in terms of, of those two things working together because recall that estrogen is going to increase and as it increases, it will signal the pituitary gland to stop the release of FSH and stimulate that release of LH, right? So we see a little bit of a decrease happening as a result of FSH or as a result of that estrogen increasing we see some FSH decrease approximately here and then we'll see a little bit of an increase in LH but you really see that difference in in here because oops in here because you really have to think about the vast majority of LH to FSH as that ratio and so that estrogen component has a big role in that FSH being less in the bloodstream and LH being more so so that high estrogen level coincides with that high luteinizing hormone level. And then again, as that progesterone value increases, when we think about progesterone, it's going to decrease that GnRH. And as a result of that, negatively inhibit some of the other processes that are associated with GnRH. And then finally, we have the actual menstrual cycle itself, the growth and breakdown of that uterine lining. As that ovulation process reaches its peak and that mature egg uh, is released at about the 14-day cycle, you start the, the overall, oops, the overall, um, oh, Lord, that's too large. The overall thickening at each of these stages of that uterine lining until it reaches this type of it and as you like it increases in thickness at a large large amount and then as a result of that increase in thickness and heavy vascularization you have a large amount of blood flow and so if that fertilized egg doesn't make its way into that uterine lining uh it sheds the entire lining and, and that's essentially what leads to that menstrual flow or the period uh that female humans experience and, and most female species experience some type of period um, it's a little bit different in other species. If you ever take zoology class, it's interesting to, to explore how different female mammals specifically uh, go through the menstrual cycle and, overall. But uh, in general, that breakdown of that uterine lining is what leads to the, uh, the leaving of, of blood as a result of it. So now we're going to look at that cycle in a little bit more detail. And, and as I alluded to with fertilization not occurring, it's talking about that corpus luteum shrinking over time, that yellow structure we saw at the 14 day mark after the egg was released. And after about 10 days, this leads to lower hormone levels overall. We're gonna see less progesterone result in FSH and LH production resuming. And then that new cycle can begin anew. 
Uh, if fertilization does occur within 24 hours of ovulation, a series of mitotic divisions will happen of that zygote, 2N back from grade 11 when you learned about this stuff, to form an embryo. And once that embryo implants itself in that thickened uterine lining, it will then release, release the hormone HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. And it's interesting to think about this hormone because it only shows up during pregnancy and its main function is to prevent that corpus luteum from breaking down. So it will continue the production of those hormones and it will maintain that uterine lining, which will effect effectively prevent menstruation and it will keep that fertilized egg where it needs to go. And in fact, it continues to thicken that uterine lining to provide the necessary resources for that newly fertilized zygote. It will also, interestingly enough, suppress a mother's immune system. So any pregnant female animal will have its immune system suppressed as a result of this HCG. And excess of HCG is also seen in urine. So that progesterone, consistent progesterone production, as well as this HCG is going to be what we utilize urine analysis for. And it will be the main uh, hormones that we see in uh, pregnancy tests that are being measured for that progesterone as well as HCG. So the, Im Oops. the implantation of the embryo within that uterine lining, uh, it, that embryo is going to grow quite rapidly, right? The placenta will then form and that uterine lining uh, that's going to provide that nourishment will can, uh, to that growing embryo. Again, that's why it was so highly vascularized. That high connection to that bloodstream of the mother will allow for a large quantity of nutrients to be supplied to the rapidly growing embryo. And that placenta helps to kind of facilitate the, uh, the nourishment component. So that placenta is kind of like a storage for foodstuffs, if you will, for that growing embryo. And it's that uh, slow breakdown of that placenta in some way, shapes, or form that will allow for that embryo to get that nutrient. So high levels of progesterone, again, will continue to thicken that uterus, uh, specifically the, th the uterine mucus level or the lining that connects that uterus to the vagina. And it will create that plug that will essentially seal the opening of the cervix. This also helps to create a closed system that doesn't allow bacteria, viruses, uh, or anything of that so sort to enter from into the uterus, which could harm that potentially growing fetus. So the, the cervix is staying closed in this regard and it will keep that embryo inside, creating a closed system. 10 weeks after implantation, the placenta takes over for the secretion of progesterone and HCG. Uh, uh, levels will continue to decrease in the actual uh, the mother. So when you look at the placenta's job, not only does it provide nutrients, but it will also then start to provide the necessary uh, progesterone and HCG secretions, right? So it's taking over the secretion of those, and that, as a result of that, it's going to drop within the, the mother's body. So the corpus luteum will continue to secrete the hormone that's called relaxin. Uh, this relaxin will prevent the uterus from contracting properly until, the close, until it's very close to birth. Uh, so it will relax the muscles of the uterus and it will prevent labor from actually happening. Uh, so when you do study the process of labor uh, one day, and you look at the hormonal components of it, and you look at the biological factors of it, you'll start to see some of the reverse of all of these things happening, uh, which is kind of interesting to, to consider. I won't ask a question on it, but it's interesting to consider. So how can reproduction be controlled with hormone? There are several aspects of uh, human nature that kind of contribute to this. Some people don't want to have children. Some people desperately want to have children. And as a result of that, we can utilize our understanding of hormones to kind of uh, help those each of those people out, so to speak. So when we think about hormonal birth control, uh, birth control pills, patches, IUDs, which are intrauterine devices, which are inserted, inserted through the vagina into the uterus, uh, they're all examples of hormones that are going to be, or they're all example of ways to deliver hormones uh, to prevent that, uh, essentially that thickening of the lining, so to speak, if an egg is fertilized. So progesterone and or estrogen secreted in small quantities each day will help keep that cycle from properly forming a uh, fertilized zygote and then that fertilized zygote from being taken up into the uterus. So those slow, steady secretion amounts of progesterone and or estrogen will keep that cycle level that we looked at above 
and it will prevent that uh, implantation of that fertilized egg. Likewise, when we look at fertility drugs, uh, these hormones are going to be administered in an attempt to help people become pregnant. So large quantities of different types of hormones, and it's, uh, it's not really one or the other. There's no general, here's your hormone cocktail and it will help you get pregnant. Each person is different. Uh, each female has different hormone levels at different times, and it really needs to be tailor-made uh, for that person. And it's important to, when consulting with a doctor to, to have those ideas and those aspects discussed properly because it's going to be dis administered in large quantities. Uh, and as I alluded to earlier, there are other receptors, but uh, ultimately there are some people that really want to have children, and, and these medications and these hormones can be utilized to help them reach that goal. So that was the female reproductive system. We're now going to look at the male reproductive system in a bit more detail and, and how that works in context with uh, comparing and contrasting it to the female reproductive system. So there's just some of the general anatomy that I'll be referring to with regards to the structure and function of each of those organs. Uh, in, oops, in the male reproductive organ, the first one we'll look at, and the biggest one that we'll look at in terms of hormonal production is the gonads or the testes. So a pair of testes, each containing approximately uh, 125 meters of seminal furous tubules where sperm mature and exit the testes. So when you think about how uh, the testes work, 125 meters of these tubules uh, that sperm have to basically mature in and travel through, like that's a pretty large amount of, of tissue that's dedicated to it. And we'll talk about why afterwards. It's going to secrete hormones that are called androgens or androgenins. Uh, testosterone is the main one that we'll talk about with regards to males. Uh, they're going to stimulate and control development of those secondary sexual characteristics. So we're talking about the growth of facial hair and body hair, uh, muscle development, deeper voice, and overall sex drive. It's also responsible for the signaling of the testes to produce sperm. The next one is the scrotum. It is a bag-like structure that surrounds the testes to help regulate temperature of the testes. Uh, it's a very thin tissue uh, that has a very good heat dissipation capacity because when we talk a little bit later about how sperm works, uh, heat is a big issue with regards to how they function properly. So if things get too warm, uh, it can denature some of those proteins and kill off sperm en masse. The epididymis is a coiled storage tubule that is attached to the surface of those testes, uh, specifically that the one, each testy has that epididymis and it collects and stores sperm from the seminiferous fluid or tubule, sorry, until ejaculation. And it's that location of sperm production within the seminiferous tubules and the collection of those sperm in the epididymis, which allows for the uh, essentially a storage system of large quantities of sperm until ejaculation. The vas deferens is a thick walled tube that is very muscular and it extends through the abdominal cavity. It's responsible for transporting sperm uh, from the epididymis to the urethra by muscular contractions. Uh, so it's going to look at removing sperm from the epididymis, that storage, via ejaculation through muscular contractions, uh, and it will travel through the urethra, which we look at next. It is the narrow tube that transports the semen, sperm, as well as other fluids outside of the body, so that way it can be utilized to fertilize the egg that we looked at earlier. It's also responsible for the release of urine uh, in the um, excretory system, which we looked at in uh, last couple of lessons ago with regards to kidney and kidney function. So just like with regards to the egg production, where we looked at oogenesis, we're also going to look at spermatogenesis. It is the process with which males make sperm cells from those precursor spermatocytes. Uh, this process takes anywhere from nine to 10 weeks and testes produce approximately 130 million fertile sperm each day. Once males have reached puberty, they continue making sperm for their entire life cycle. It is initiated by that same hormone, that GnRH signals, many times throughout the day. So that sperm production is consistently going on within that 125 meters of that seminiferous tubules en masse, 24-7, uh, for the rest of the, a male's life from the time they reach puberty until the time they reach death usually. Sometimes it can stop halfway through. Um, other factors can in fact contribute to it. Uh, diet, health, uh, overall exercise amount, genetics, all sorts of different factors. But on average, 
sperm is produced from the time puberty starts uh, to the time that male stops living. So when we think about the hormones in uh, spermatogenesis, again, we talked about that GnRH. Once males are sexually mature via puberty, the hypothalamus will secrete GnRH approximately one, or approximately every one to two hours, which causes the pituitary gland to secrete that LH and FSH, just like with regards to female hormones. Uh, it's a little bit different in terms of concentration, uh, and mainly the realistic component is that it's going to impact a different system later on, and we'll talk about testosterone in a bit. Uh, but essentially, we're looking at the same hormones here between men and women, just in different concentrations uh, and different receptor cells. So LH will stimulate the secretion of testosterone from the testes. That's the big difference with regards to uh, males and females. Like, while females do produce testosterone and males produce uh, progesterone and estrogen, the concentration amounts are, are significantly different. So when you think about testosterone, uh, it's going to stimulate that sperm production and it will control the growth and function of those male reproductive structures. So once that puberty starts and that GnRH stimulates LH and FSH, which then in turn stimulates testosterone production uh, once puberty is reached, it's, uh, it's a process that once that testosterone really starts to get built up within the system, it will you'll start to see those secondary sexual characteristics develop. So like I said, it's also within females, but it's not responsible for any egg production directly at all. Uh, we don't really talk about the specifics of it, but it does help with muscle production uh, as well as several other factors. So that FSH stimulates what's called serotoli cells, and it will secrete proteins and other molecules that are required for that spermatogenesis. So while LH is responsible for the secretion of testosterone, which stimulates sperm production, FSH is responsible for the stimulation of Sertoli cells, which secrete proteins as well as other stuff that are required for, spermatogen for spermatogenesis. So it's going to support the development of spermatocytes, essentially. Okay, so let's take a look at the negative feedback system of hormonal control within males uh, in spermatogenesis. So those Sertoli cells, as I alluded to, they're located in that seminiferous uh, tubules within the testes. And they're going to help provide nutrients to the developing sperm cells. So when they are activated, they will allow for the production of, the, of sperm cells because it will produce enough nutrients as well as um, the, the correct hormonal supports to develop those sperm cells. And again, it's controlled by FSH. And then we have Leydig cells. Those Leydig cells are responsible. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about responsibility later. But they're surrounded by the seminiferous tubules and they surround them in its entirety. So they're gonna produce those androgens or the testosterone that are responsible for the actual production of sperm. So they are controlled by that luteinizing hormone, Leydig luteinizing, and testosterone is necessary for, for the sperm cell production in those Sertoli cells. So there's a big connection between those two of them. Uh, so as we see in the, the, oops, as we see in this diagram, the positive and negative feedbacks that are involved because when GNRH is, is responsible for or released and is responsible for regulating the release of FSH and LH within that anterior pituitary gland, you're going to start to see that positive increase of, of all of the things that LH and FSH are responsible for. So you're looking at the production of testosterone, you're looking at the stimulation of those Leydig and those Sertoli cells as a result of LH and FSH production. And this testosterone can then act on the reproductive structures and many other target cells. Uh, and it is essentially now we're starting to see that positive feedback loop. Now, once testosterone reaches a certain amount of quantity, you'll start to see some negative feedback on GnRH as well as luteinizing hormone. So when you think about luteinizing hormone and its connection directly to testosterone, recognize that LH is directly responsible for testosterone production. So of course we would expect testosterone to negatively impact or negatively feed back on that luteinizing hormone. As it reaches high concentrations, it will negatively inhibit that LH production in the pituitary gland. With regards to the negative inhibition of that FSH, we're looking at the inhibin, which is a protein um, or a, um, a hormone that's produced by the Sertoli cells once sperm production continues and continues and continues. And at large quantities of sperm production, we'll start to see negative feedback on FSH via inhibin. And I'll talk about those just below. Actually, I don't, I don't talk about that at all, really. I'm not, I think about it. It's just a, the brief 
uh, interlude here. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, just understanding the general ideas of those negative feedback systems and positive feedback systems, they're consistent within every system, right? Like whatever is being produced, in this case, LH uh, in the pituitary gland, that LH will then activate those Leydig cells and positively as LH increases in concentration, more Leydig cells are stimulated and that will allow for the production of testosterone. Once that testosterone, however, reaches critical mass, it will negatively inhibit LH. And, and just like all of those negative feedback loops we've looked at. So the last thing I wanna talk about is hormonal treatments with regards to uh, fertility treatments. Fertility treatments can look to increase sperm production and then birth control treatments can look to decrease sperm production. Uh, this is an interesting one because unfortunately, um, a lot of research has gone at looking how only women can be uh, responsible for birth control. And it's, a uh, you know, if you wanna talk about the societal and, and gender differences between that, um, you know, there are, birth control doesn't come without its potential negative uh, side effects. Uh, so it's kind of unfair to expect one gender or sex only to be responsible for that. But in the last five, 10 years, there have been a lot of um, breakthroughs with regards to male birth control treatments that look to decrease or stop sperm production altogether. Um, so it's interesting to think about it in, in that context. Uh, so I'll stop recording here. And I'm sure you all have many questions about some of these negative feedback loops. Uh, so I will answer them as we go.